Um, this talk is going to be a little brief because we've had some odd anomalies getting our space set up. So thank you to the folks who brought extra chairs. Uh, thanks to James for using them. Um, it's worked out pretty well. We're definitely going to need these chairs because at uh, 5 o'clock, our, our closing session is John O'Bacon showing off Ubuntu on the smartphone. Uh, if you didn't see that at CE uh, the video from CES, you've missed out some really good ideas. As I was telling us earlier in the first session, uh, the thing about the design of the phone, the way they make full use of the screen space, after you see it, it looks so obvious, you wonder how iOS and Android got it so wrong. So I think you're going you're gonna to like that. I'm looking forward to it. In the meantime, I wanted to talk to you about Life Code. And for me, this is maybe my most exciting presentation because I get to bring my two greatest software loves together. I love Ubuntu and I love Life Code. But for most of Life Code's life, it's been a proprietary development tool. And right now, they have a plan to bring it open source. So I get to bring it here to share it with my friends. So this is going to be a good time. It's a topic I know too well, and I tend to get excited about it and lose track of time. But we've already, you know, we want to stay on schedule as much as we can. May I enlist you? You have a watch? No. Okay, who has a watch? At the half hour mark, at the half hour mark, you just say, dude, really, you know. Uh, and then I'll start winding it down. I understand that. I'm going to race through this slide set. I want to try to bring us back on schedule. I want to make full use of Jono's time because that smart the smartphone design is really well worth taking some time with. Uh, but here, all I want to do is to introduce you to Live Code, tell you a little bit about what it is and why people like me have found it so enamoring, and show you I brought along some uh, slides of examples of things people have built with it. It's not really going to get you very deep into Live Code. What I hope happens is that some of you, I think, I think maybe more than a few of you, will walk out of here saying, I can use that. And then you can go download it, and then you will have questions. And my last slide has a place where you can learn more about it. Uh, and the package itself contains a lot of stuff. So let's just dive in and make it happen. Um, Life Code is famous because it's not, well, famous among some of us. As a proprietary tool in the 21st century, it's only going to go so far. Um, people use Python. People use uh, Ruby. Life Code has advantages they don't have. We'll get to some of the others, but the biggest one that people choose it for is that it's beyond cross-platform. In my world of proprietary development, uh, you know, if you can deploy to Mac and Windows, that's enough. And Live Code does that, but it also does Linux, in addition to Windows and Mac, and it also deploys to iOS, and it deploys to Android. And right now, the team is working on, and I've been given permission to tell you here, they all there is a server version as well, but the secret one is Raspberry Pi. They've got, uh, an, they've got a Linux ARM build in the works, so you can use this in schools teaching on Raspberry Pi. You can use this on desktop Linux with x86. You can use this on your servers. Uh, I have a surprising number of server apps. I'll show you one of them here in a bit. Um, it's, it's a very versatile little engine. What makes it worth using on any of those platforms? Um, if you've done any coding at all, most coding is a lot of memorization of arcane symbols. Uh, no programming language is going to be English because English is really kind of a stupid language to be talking to a machine too dumb to count past one. <laughs> so, you know, English is rich with its, its variations and its ambiguities, and machines can't handle ambiguity. So, no syntax is going to be truly English. But an English like syntax is nice. It makes learning the language easy, and it makes reading it really easy. You'll find that uh, code written in live code is often considered uh, very self-commenting. Zero compile time. When you work in another program, uh, most programming languages, you type your code, then you press a compile button, then you enjoy the stroll to the coffee pot. Then it's done compiling, you run your app. You find your bug. You identify in the debugger where the bug is. You quit. You go back to that line of coding your source. You fix it. You press the compile button. You wait. It's done. Then you go through all the steps you went through to bring your app back to life, to go through the sequence, to get to the point where you found the bug, and you, you fixed it, but the line after it has a bug. Okay, so you quit, and then you... Live code is called live code because the code is live. You're in runtime, and it is dynamically compiled, and we'll show you a little bit about that, but uh, there is no compile cycle. The debugger is there, everything is there, and it's all just sort of this living thing that you're in. 
Um, integrated object model is, is an advantage over Python, and I, uh, Python is well respected and for good reason. But when you want to make graphical user applications for it, you're adding on things. You're using WX widgets or some other add-on, and then you're dealing with the syntax for that library, and you're learning a whole lot of new stuff that was never in core Python. And then you have the other question, am I using version 2 or version 3? But with live code, it was designed from the start to be optimized for graphical user applications so that the language inherently has an understanding of what a button is, what a field is, what a window is. These things are an integral part of the language and as much a part of it as you know, math operations and string handling and all the other stuff. Because of these graphical capabilities, it's one of the few toolkits that can be used adequately all the way from the earliest sketches of an app. So you sit down with a client and you're just brainstorming and you drop objects into a window and sort of mock it up. And as you go, you add more and more code to it and then you ship that. You ship what started as your prototype as you flesh it out. In most other toolkits, you start with a drawing program and you talk about that and then you go away and you code in something entirely different. But here, the layout, development, deployment can happen in one thing. And uh, with all due respect to those people who struggled with the difference between Python 2 and 3, um, this application is self-contained standalone. They often refer to applications as standalones in the live code world because when you build, you never guess what you get. You get an application that stands alone. There is no dependencies within the system other than the most basic things that we can expect pretty much all modern Linux systems to have. And this is true also for Mac, Windows, iOS, and Android. The baseline requirements are noted at the, uh, the project site, and meeting those is pretty easy. It's usually systems going back several years, so it's not hard to meet those. And, and beyond those very basic considerations, everything the application needs is in one self-contained executable file. That opens up a world of distribution ease and sharing things, especially for in-house um, utilities within a business. Because there is a server module and because it works nicely on mobile devices and tablets as well as desktops, laptops, building rich client server applications, that's kind of an easy thing. It has, for example, uh, HTTP. Most things you want to do with HTTP are one-liners. If you want to get the contents of a URL or a CGI out uh, somewhere on the web, you use the get command. <laughs> and that value comes back. Put, you can use the put protocol with the put command. Put data into URL, and it packages it up and sends that out. So it's really convenient for both client and server app. It's inherently extensible because no system is going to have everything you need for every type of app. So it has a mechanism by which you can write modules in a lower level language and plug them in. It's also embeddable. Uh, there has been a very large company in Europe recently who wanted to use these graphical GUI capabilities with inside a much larger framework they had written in C++. So they worked out a license to do this within that proprietary product by embedding uh, live code within this larger product and it's set up now in a form that allows that rather easily. So let me take a look, let me show you a couple things about live code. We're going to do a very basic build. This is the live code environment as you would open it first. You've got a toolbar at the top that has the, uh, pardon me, I just want to be conscious of time there. Um, the toolbar at the top has the menus, has the icons for the things you're going to use most often, and then here's um, a toolbar of commonly used elements. So let's make a... Uh, a window, and I'm not going to get too much into the programming syntax of this or the nomenclature for this language. Um, I could, but then I would just go off into the weeds and we'd start building stuff and we'd make all these applications and then it would be 7 o'clock and John has gone home and all that. So we're going to try to keep this short. One thing I will show you is, I'm going to drag a couple objects down here. So there's a standard button, there's a default button, we've done a tab. Note that the appearance of the tab control is more or less what we expect to see for the Ubuntu Human Interface Guidelines. This same object on this window, if I save this and open this file up in Mac or Windows, it follows the Human Interface Guidelines for those platforms. They actually mesh the internal object record with the OS type definitions, the control definitions, 
in a way that gives us a really good mix of us as developers being able to lay out very, we do things in a consistent way. We address this object in the live code syntax and live code figures out what the OS needs to do to draw it appropriate to that OS. Um, the rest of the controls are ordinary stuff you've seen. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. So you've seen lists and um, other things. So I'm going to throw this all away. And we're going to do, oh, this is probably worth showing. That's our inspector, much like you would have with a drawing program. Here we're basically drawing an application. So you have alignment options and you have uh, uh, the ability to change properties of different objects. Um, to do a very simple thing to show you about the coding. And trust me, I could go on for days about this. I, I teach live code a lot, and I love it. So if you do have any questions about coding in live code, um, you know, let's go and have a beer tonight and talk about it all night long, because I love this stuff. Yeah, he, he already installed it an hour ago. He's been playing with it ever since. Um, there really isn't much quite like it, is there? I mean, it, it is an unusual beast. So I've already bumped the font size up in the script editor, so just so you know, it doesn't come you know, in geriatric font size by default. <laughs> you laugh. I'm wearing reading glasses these days, but, uh, but I set this up so we could all have fun together. Uh, the, the system is set up. Let me go back here for just a moment. So we have two objects I've put here. This is a field, and in fields, is that's where we type text. Um, oh, and I think, I think this is true for... Linux, yes. Um, drag and drop is what we expect from modern interfaces. Drag and drop is what naturally happens in the text field object in live code on every platform. There's also a whole bunch of messages. So you can interpret these messages and you can modify that behavior and you can drop things from the desktop and you can drop things from the desktop into it. So just like cut, copy, paste are supported, drag and drop, as you just saw, we did a drag and drop editing. And if you tried to do that in the GTK uh, interface, you could do it, but you're writing a lot of code. Here, it's the default of how it works because it's the default of what users have come to expect. But right now, I'm gonna kill that text. We have a button. Um, we want to be able to have this button put the words, hello world, into the first field here. So um, I needed to respond on mouse up. And I want on mouse up to put hello world. I wonder what that syntax would look like. So we open up the script editor for that button. And we have a message handler, just like modern operating systems where things are driven by objects that receive messages from the OS, letting it know what's happening in the world. Here the button is receiving messages. We can use a great many. There's mouse double up. There's the drag and drop messages. There's mouse down. There's mouse still down. And you might need that sometimes. You'd be surprised whole bunch, but the most common one is mouse up. So when a mouse up event happens, we're going to use some really arcane syntax in order to put hello world into field one. We're going to say put hello world into field one. Thank you, see? Real time debugging. That's live code. So we click the button and we get a response. Woohoo! Now this application, we've invested a lot of time building this, and now we want to share this with our friends. Uh, <laughs> this is big. This is a really big deal. All our friends are like, hey, I need that app. Um, I'm not, I have all these fields without hello world in them, so let's do that. So um, <laughs> when you want to build an application, so we first need to save this file. I'll save it to the desktop. Okay, so there's our application now we can set our standalone settings. So we're gonna call this app uh, Steep. And we could go through all these, but you see, there's a lot of options here, and for each of the platforms, there's a lot of options, because it builds for Mac, Windows, and Linux, blah, 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 blah. So by default, it's set up for Mac, Windows, and Linux. Uh, we're gonna not even bother with the mobile stuff, but just note, when you're dealing with mobile devices, we take a lot of stuff for granted on mobile devices. Mobile apps, in many ways are harder than desktop apps because that simplicity requires a lot of magic to make that happen. So you're dealing with push notifications and camera notifications and other things, and the toolkit provides point and click options for setting up uh, those options for both Android and iOS. Here, we're just gonna make this application for Mac, Windows, and Linux. So 
I'm just going to leave those default settings and just build this and see what happens. So we're going to stay save as a standalone application. We're going to select the destination for it. And it wants to save. And then it builds. And there it is. And now I've just built for uh, three different operating systems in a few seconds. Well, that can't be right. And I've actually not rehearsed this part of the talk. So let's see what happens. So I have a button, uh, or rather a folder, named after the uh, application I'm building. And oh, look, there's uh, a Windows executable. There's a Mac executable. And what happens up there? My there's my application. And the application runs bug-free and spelling error-free, thanks to help from the audience. So um, obviously, that's a pretty uninteresting app. But the idea was to show you that, to show you just the lay of the land. So if you want to download this and play with this, you at least know Tools are here, tools are there, you drag stuff, you can write scripts. They have a really extensive set of documentation that comes with it. Um, I dare say, with, with all respect to the many uh, open source projects that are out there, many of them are underdocumented. Uh, this one is arguably overdocumented. Your question will be not, where do I find the help to do this, but rather, I'm finding a lot of help on this and I'm not sure where I should start, which one I should do first. So that's, that's a good problem to have. So with that brief introduction to the toolkit, let me show you a few things um, that I've built with it, some of my friends have built with it. This is an application that's used in emergency rooms in children's hospitals around the world. A child comes in, requires resuscitation. Um, the child is weighed. That entry is put into uh, um, this calculator, which then produces this protocol diagram. And so everyone in the emergency room now can follow this one thing with drug dosages and equipment sizes tailored for the patient at hand. Doctors cannot say, for obvious reasons, that uh, this application is saving lives that may not have been saved <laughs> before they had it. But in the world without this, they were doing these calculations on napkins or off the top of their head. Or, oh, hey, Steve, did you bring your calculator? And uh, this is making a difference. We're getting some very positive feedback from the doctors who are using this in their clinics. And um, this is the type of application that is so specialized that it would have been largely cost prohibitive to write in a lower level language like C. But here, we not only have this, we also have a reference thing. We have a board of some 20 emergency pediatric specialists around the world contributing using a CMF that we built using the client server capabilities, all of it in live code, and we ported it to the web, and the web version is driven by live code. And the amount of code that we needed to port both this resuscitation tool and our custom search engine to port that from a desktop app that runs on C platform to the web was about two hours because all I had to do is to take the outputs that were already being displayed in fields and wrap some HTML around them to put them out on the web. Um, this is a transcription program currently available for Mac and Windows. Um, it, we're out of time. <laughs> I could go on about all these. The key here is that there's a lot of stuff going on with keystrokes. Uh, the point of this app is that if, you're, if you want to do a lot of transcription, but you don't want to invest in a foot pedal, but you need to do a fair bit of transcription, you can type, and thank you, you can type from the, from the home row and control the video from the home row, and it makes really good use of the type of messages that live code sends to fields, of which there's a great variety. This is a product I publish. It's a very simple thing. It's a web page equivalent of what Word Merge does in terms of taking lists of things and putting them into templates that wind up being published on the web. The key that's interesting here is certainly not the beauty of the app, it's just standard controls, but the same layout without alteration in my code. This is what it looks like for my Ubuntu customers, but when you take it over to Mac, it looks like that, and on Windows it looks like that, and I'm not writing a line of code to do that. So it's conforming substantially to the human interface guidelines without any effort. Similarly, my friend Ken makes this program called Stick, and it's kind of a fun stick animation tool. There's actually a huge culture of people that make stick figure animations. <laughs> um, I had no idea. But again, we see the same thing here. We see uh, this is Ubuntu, this is uh, Mac, and here we have the same app on Windows. So distracted by technology there. Uh, this is a contact management system. Um, I could get into the story behind this, but again, the main point with this one is the cross-platform nature of it and the consistency of the layout as it adapts for the host OS. 
here's just a random sampling of things I found within the live code programming community of stuff that's out there on mobile devices. These are some phone apps. Uh, this is a Realty app from uh, France, uh, an app that uh, ad adapts itself from tablets to smartphones. Uh, my friend Scott Rossi is really into taking advantage of a great live code feature. Um, another one-liner in the program is that you can set the window shape of any window to a custom shape very easily, and he loves to use that in some of his designs. He's done a wide range of interfaces um, for commercial clients. These last two were from Logitech. Uh, things that they ship with some of their devices. Um, it's been useful for producing a lot of multimedia stuff because in addition to the things I showed you about text manipulation and so forth, it also has some um, unusually strong support for multimedia handling, playing videos, playing audio, uh, graphics with gradients, and all sorts of things all under script control. Uh, these are a whole collection of uh, individual uh, custom-shaped windows, more custom-shaped windows, Lots of fun stuff along those lines. Uh, another install installer tool from Logitech. Um, music players. And now we get to the point, before we get into some Q&A, I hope you guys may have a question or two. This has been a proprietary tool, and it's been around for a very long time. It was first built in the days before Linux was invented. The first version of this engine was built by a guy named Scott Rainey, graduated from University of Boulder in 92. It was available at that time for six flavors of Unix. He has um, since ported that to Linux, and then he ported that to Windows, and then Mac, and then it was acquired by RunRev in Edinburgh. They have since added iOS and Android deployments, and now they're working uh, right now, as we speak, on the Linux ARM deployment so it can run on Raspberry and other small-scale things like that. This is a lot of work to maintain an engine that does all this. And as we know, uh, it's a very competitive environment because in the modern world, developers look at languages and they're like, oh, I'm used to seeing open source today. So there was a time when proprietary tools were a more common thing, and that's less so today. So they're trying to find the best way to move this into an open source platform. And they have a C++ code base. That's a good thing. But working against them is that there are half a million lines of code in this code base, originally architected by a single man. <laughs> since they now have a team of some seven engineers that work on this, but it is still somewhat fairly monolithic across its 700 source files. So if you've worked with scale FOSS projects, you see the problem here. This is not going into Git. <laughs> this is not going into Git. It will not be something the community can embrace and do check in, check out, and all that stuff. So they need to be able to get this from the state that it's in to a state that's really suitable for community involvement. And that's not cheap. Because if they weren't doing this, if they had to fund it all themselves, they'd have to fund it on sales revenue. Now, like MySQL and others, they're pursuing a dual license strategy. So there'll be a community edition governed by GPL. And <coughs> people like my clients who need to deliver proprietary work, Logitech and HP and others that deliver commercial works on it, they can still get a commercial license. But obviously, when you open this up like this, a great many people, educators, small business owners making internal tools where they're not distributing the code, most of the use cases of this type of thing are perfectly well suited by GPL. They're fine with that, but if they also have to invest in getting this monster of a code base into Git, that's a huge investment. So they're looking at this problem. They realize that having community support means a massive refactoring effort not going to happen immediately. So they decided, how do other people do this? Mozilla has done this, oddly enough, we love the irony of this, uh, through money earned from proprietary software. Uh, Mitch Kapoor, Lotus123, put a couple million into Mozilla, and they were able to take the Mark Andreessen code base and build uh, a community out of it that built an entire world of things. And now Mozilla is a very big deal, but that initial transition was long and painful and paid for by some corporate donations. We see this with a lot of projects that begin as closed source and then they reach that point in the maturity where open source is the logical thing to do. But here, the folks at LiveCode don't have a millionaire in the wings waiting to give them several million dollars. So how are they going to do this? Crowdfunding. That's their hope. So they've taken the costing for all this stuff, they put it together on a Kickstarter page, and as timing would have it, 
uh, we are now six days away from ending that this Kickstarter cycle. So it's uh, if you go to the website, I've put cards all over the room for the website where this is at. You can learn more about the Kickstarter campaign. You can talk with people in your organization, see if it's the type of thing that's of interest to you. Um, if it is, they would love it if you wanted to contribute. It's not a small sum they're looking for because this is not a small effort. So what they're looking for, great results, is uh, they're in the UK, it's 350,000 pounds. That is just under half a million US. Now, John was like nodding his head like, yeah, I've actually I've seen some big code bases. That's probably what it's going to take. Yeah, and most of the people I know who manage large projects see that as a realistic number. So that's what they hope to achieve. They're down to the last few days to see if we can do this. If it works, the plan is this. The day after the Kickstarter fund is successfully they will release the code as it is, but they understand they're not going to get a lot of community support. What they will do is bring on some new engineering effort so that while they're continuing to do things like the Raspberry Pi build and the other things, these guys are just going to be working on the less active modules to refactor this. So they've got a plan laid out, and the, the details are all at this site. It's some reasonably good project management, and they've had some good advisement on it. Within six months at the outside, they plan to have that refactoring done. This will then live at Git. It will then be in a place where if you see an enhancement you want to make, you can check out the code, fix it, put in a pull request, and it's just like any other project. But rather than taking three years to get to that point, thanks to the Kickstarter fund, they will have compressed that down to a six-month effort. So that's a little bit about what live code is, um, why people like me use it. You've gotten a little taste of it. They do have a free version that you can download to play around with right now to see if it's of interest to you. And I've been using it for a very long time, and I always feel compelled to pay these things forward. Um, with both Live Code and with Ubuntu, I feel this huge debt of gratitude because um, they've done so much for me and my friends to have a good time. So if you want to learn about Live Code, it's at runrev.com. If you start to work with it, you will have questions because it is definitely an unusual way of working. And with that, I think, it is an unusual level of productivity. But it also means some mind-bending whoa. Well, really? Is that how you do that here? <laughs> it's a strange tool. You will have questions. They have forums. You can find the forums easily at runrev.com. Um, I'm in those forums almost every day, just as I am in the Ubuntu forums. And my handle at the live code forums is fourth world. So don't be shy. Look me up. Ask a question. Post a question there. Um, I would love to hear from you. Because if this tool is of interest to you, uh, I think you're about to have a very good time. So that's what I have now. Now we're a little bit pressed for time. We've got, actually, okay, we've got 20 minutes. So we can do five minutes of solid Q&A, and then I'm happy to say, go ahead and do your break, and I'll continue doing Q&A uh, beyond that as well. Do we have a question here? Uh, oh, we'll see. All. Yes. <laughs> they used to have this thing where, you know, as a proprietary product, they're like, okay, what's the mix that's going to attract the right amount of money? So they thought, well, We'll have a base cost for the IDE, and then you pick the platforms you want to deploy to. And that meant that they're appealing to commercial devs, and that meant Mac and Windows were selling well, and it meant people weren't using Linux. And I complained about that because I want to encourage people to port to Linux. And as we saw here, in many cases, porting to Linux is a checkbox. We just need to make it encouraging for people to do that. And if, they're not, if they have to pay extra for the Linux engine, it's not going to happen. Well, this is, this is where I was heading, so bear with me, and then, then see if I got this right. So now, everything that they do as a company, whether it's the community edition or the proprietary licensed commercial edition, both of them will allow you to both develop on and deploy to Mac, Windows, Linux, and additionally deploy to iOS and Android. So both versions will have full platform coverage. The code bases will be virtually identical. There is a feature in the product that lets you... Um, uh, encrypt the scripts so you have protection for your code base, but of course that's incompatible with GPL, so there's no reason to ever use the feature. So that won't be a part of the GPL code base. Um, but otherwise, all of the features will be the same on every platform. That is a good point. If you were going to make apps for iOS, and this is not a problem with live code or even Apple, and it, in all fairness, not even with the Free Software Foundation. It's just that Apple. Apple's App Store says when you get an app, even if it's a no, not for fee app, you can distribute it on up to five devices. 
And GPL says, we're all about sharing now. And so <laughs> GPL means unlimited sharing. And limiting to five devices has been a point where the Free Software Foundation has said, we think those terms are incompatible. So you could build with the free community version, but when it comes time to submit to the App Store, you would at that point need to get a commercial license because the GPL would be incompatible with the App Store license. Yes, sir. You know, that's a very good thought, and thank you for that reference. I didn't know anyone else in the room was old enough to pick up on that. Your beard is too dark to know HyperCard. How did that happen? Yeah. Um, when it was born was during HyperCard's heyday, and there were a number of products. Uh, Sybase had a product based on the same language. Um, Oracle had media object. A great many companies invested in um, similar products to the point that to refer to them generically in the family tree of languages, that branch me and my friends call XTalk because there's HyperTalk and SuperTalk and Oracle Media Talk and blah, blah, blah. And so there's the whole XTalk world. And this began as one of those. It's just gone off into all of those. All of those except Oracle Media Objects were platform specific. It is. And at this point, there are two standing. Uh, SuperCard is still Mac only and still working. In fact, the guy who uh, is their lead developer is a good friend of mine. And if you need to do Mac only stuff, it's a nice system. But if you want to hit six different platforms with the same code base, then, you know, code does what it does. But yeah, it's a very similar language, which means that there's a whole class of educators from, you know, even into the late 90s that can immediately jump on a tool like this because they understood how easy it was to build their own courseware and things using tools like HyperCard. Yes, sir? Mm-hmm. Well, the company's been doing well. I mean, even with the expense, as you can imagine, the expense of maintaining an engine that works on six different platforms is, is not minor, but everybody who's using it has paid for it. In the future, what they hope is this. Everyone will be using it. <laughs> and so while the percentage of people that need to pay for it for commercial deployment is much smaller, the pie has then gotten so much larger that that number is now an increase in revenue. Yeah, yeah, it's similar to MySQL in that sense, that, that there's a community edition and a commercial license edition. Any other questions? Are you? <coughs> oh, for a brief while, they experimented with a web plugin option. Is that you're referring to the icon? There was an icon for that on the standalone builder. Uh, that is one platform that is no longer supported simply because uh, the whole plugin interface is not an interesting space for any vendor to be spending a lot of time. Browsers are... Who uses browser plugins? What we're finding with live is that with the one-liners to communicate through the internet, um, if you're talking with a stakeholder who wants a software solution that requires a one-time install as a browser plugin would, then you can give them a standalone application just as easily. But the advantage is you're no longer contained inside of a browser. You're no longer beholden to the requirements of a browser, and you have um, an application whose interface is dedicated for the task that they're installing it for. So you still have the connectivity of the web. You can still download entire interfaces and code over the web faster than you can do over the over um, uh, a browser because there's also built-in compression, not surprisingly. <laughs> um, and the function names for that are compress and uncompress, <laughs> so it's that kind of language. but. Uh, you can deliver those types of browser plugin benefits without having to do a browser plugin. Is that's the short answer, I guess. Yes, sir. Oh, it is data only. It is actually gzip. So yes, it's an implementation of gzip, so that it's data only. Um, they do, however, also. Pardon me. Yes, it is. However, they do also provide um, uh, externals. I mentioned it's extensible. They have one of the plugins that ships with the package is for Zip, and Zip does preserve uh, a, a variety of metadata, including you know things like execution bits. So um, there are other options for doing multi-file archives. Any other questions? All right. Oh, uh, yes, sir. As of today, yes, for a few more days. 
Um, I and this is one of the things that makes me hope that the open source thing goes through because right now the everything package I think the website is still until this project this transition completes still doing a per platform allocation and because I need all of them I, uh, I don't know what those prices are I would go there the everything package currently is like 750 that's what I've been paying and under the new uh, what's that well that it goes to 495 as soon as this thing happens so maybe they've already posted the new pricing but when I just renewed my license it was 750 so yeah, it's definitely going down. They don't have a community no, they don't have that yet, but I think they have begun to adjust the pricing, so it wouldn't surprise me if they posted the new price already. All right, anyone else? You guys rock. We are now back on schedule. Thank you so much. <laughs>